All right, we're about ready to begin our last session of the evening. We're grateful for your presence. We know that uh, some of you have uh, driven um, 70 miles and even greater to be here with us tonight. We're grateful for your uh, commitment to evangelism. We want to make sure that we maximize our time together. I know that you have enjoyed the fellowship. We have enjoyed meeting you, but there is a lot of a lot of road to cover tonight. We're going to introduce the evangelistic principles of Jesus tonight, and uh, we pray that it will be a life changing. Um, um, this will be a life changing experience as we go through the next two days. There are some things that we need to discuss. I want to make this more than just a gospel meeting. This is a this is a seminar, meaning that this is an actionable and practical teaching session. This is designed to, to give you something to do. So if all I do is um, if all I do is preach a couple of sermons, which I believe are effective and important, but it does not result in change, I consider that a waste of time because I could be doing that. I could be going home and I could be in a pulpit and I could be working with the church. This is designed to, to, to change the course of the ship. You want to change the course of a ship, you do it one degree at a time. And so we're going to take those steps together. Now I need your help. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to pass out the uh, reaching the lost list. Now the reaching the lost list is an important list. It's your list. It's where we will read about you. This is going to be the list for Cato Mills and or Cato Mills. And so every Wednesday morning, I'm going to put a report um, uh, into the uh, into the queue. It's going to be sent massive. Tens of thousands of Christians are going to read about the Cato Mills, Cato Mills Church. If you're not doing anything, they all know. And uh, But if you're doing something, they all know, and you'll encourage them. And so this is a way for you to not only learn about what successfully uh, uh, provides evangelistic um, direction, because I'm going to give you... Uh, teaching tools, it also is accountability. So I'm going to be accountable. So if what I teach doesn't work, you say, Rob, we're doing everything you taught and it's a complete failure. Let me know and let everybody else know. And believe me, if you'll let everybody else know, I won't be going anywhere. No one wants a failure. They don't want people who don't deliver. And the reason we've been at 28 churches this year, we have been over 100 churches the last three years, is because what we're teaching works. And um, in fact, there are people here tonight. The reason you're here tonight, because I've been at other churches and you've seen it. You have seen the dramatic turnaround. You said, we've got to get it where we're at. And so this is something that, that delivers. Now, in order to do that, you got to, I need your name. I need your address. I need your email address. Because I'm going to put this in your email box every Wednesday morning. Now, brethren, if you subscribe to Reaching the Lost, do not unsubscribe when you get it and give me bad reviews. It, it doesn't work well when it, that happens. If you don't want it, don't subscribe. But if you want to hear about baptisms, if you want to hear about success, if you want something better than coffee to wake you up on Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock, sign up. Because I'm going to send you the report of the churches that are enrolled. You're going to see picture after picture of salvation, of baptisms, of people rejoicing, of churches that are growing Every Wednesday I do this. I don't do this once a month. I do it every single week. And so this is something that I need you to do. Please put your name and your email address on it, and uh, it will be a great experience for you. Now, with that said, I need to tell you a quick story. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to put us in the right frame of mind. Last year, in the month of August, I looked at my wife. I said, honey, I said, uh, you know, I'd like to do something special for our anniversary. Now, we've been traveling all over the country last year. We hit 32 churches. And I'll tell you what happened when we hit 32 churches. And it was in August. And I said, honey, the next church is in St. Mary's, Georgia. And I said, I, 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 it's our anniversary. And I think we should leave a day or two early. And, and, and uh, maybe we could uh, spoil each other for a couple of days. She said, that sounds good. What do you have in mind? I said, I want to take a deep sea fishing trip. Maybe not what she had in mind. But she said, well, she said, you know, that sounds good. I said, now, honey, I don't want to go in the bay. I want to get the big ones. And she said, what do you mean? I said, we're going out to the ocean. And, um, and I said, I think, I, I, I bet I can find a deal. And uh, no one else is going out. And I said, so I called over to St. Mary's. I said, do y'all know anybody that could take us? He, they said, Rob, we've got, man, there, there, there are people out here that they're really good. And there's this man. He's, he's an expert. He said, call him. And so I called him. I said, are you available? He says, yes. He says, uh, I said, I'd like to go deep sea fishing. He says, bring your family. I said, what time should I be there? He said, three o'clock. I said, that doesn't give us a lot of time. He said, oh no, three in the morning. 
I said, where in hell am I going to explain this to my wife? And I said, okay. I said, no, honey, at 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh, we're and she, well, 3 o'clock? And I said, I said, I said, sir, I said, how will I know it's you when I get there at 3 o'clock in the morning? He says, I'll be the only one there. So we pulled up, and uh, we got out of the car, and sure enough, it was him, the captain, the first mate. He was, a, he was a former Marine, a big man, and my family. My dad was with us. That's it. And we get in the boat. He says, all right, guys, I have, I have a suggestion for you. He says, go to bed. <laughs> so I got it. I got, we, we got down into the hall. We went to sleep. Now, for hours, we're going out into the ocean. We get out there, and he, he wakes us up. He says, all right, time to get up. He, he claps his hand. We get up. He puts a fishing pole in all of our hands. He says, time to catch the bait. And so we throw out our lines, and he says, now everybody watch out. He says, five, four, three, two, one, pull it in. And I yank my pole. Man, I had fish all over my line. I, I'd never seen anything like we all had fish, bait fish. And we're throwing it in the live well, you know, and getting it. I said, man, this guy knows what he's doing. He counted it down. And he said, slip back in the hall and go to bed. He said, it'll be a while. So we went back to bed, and he's, he's going out there and hitting, the, you know, we're hitting it. We're in the big ones, you know, and we're going way out there. We, he finally stops the boat. He says, all right, everybody. He said, who's first? And I said, I'll go first. He said, son, he said, get ready. He said, we're going to strap you in. Strap me in? He says, oh, yes, you got to be strapped in. I said, boy, this is going to be big. He straps me in, you know, and he's got me hooked up and harnessed up. He said, he said, no, all right. He said, he, he, he puts it out there and he says, son, he said, I get ready. 10, 9, 8, he's at 7. He's got this monitor, you know, 3. He said, yeah, get right there. And I did, man alive, it was a kingfish like you never, I mean, it's called a kingfish for a reason. It is massive. And we're, um, it's incredible. I'm pulling the thing in and pull. He knew exactly where the fish were. Brethren, by one o'clock in the afternoon, we had caught our limit and we're going home. The man knew his trade. He knew exactly where the fish were. He knew exactly what kind of equipment he needed. He knew what the bait looked like. He knew what the jigs and the fishing poles and the line. He knew exactly where to go. The man had studied it. He was an expert in his field. I think we got some men sitting in our pew tonight that know more about catching catfish than you do catching souls. You know why? Because you invest in it. Because you, you put your money where your mouth is. You put your time into YouTube. You read the magazines, and man, you're ready to catch the big buck. You got the cameras out there, and you got the gun, and you got the right caliper, and you got the right feed, and you got the right location, and you got the lease given, and you'll give every evening, and you'll give all your time. You'll give all your energy because you're going to get the big buck. We got church members who are experts at catching fish, but they do not know how to catch me. How many of you right now have a tackle box somewhere you get hold of grandpa's tackle box somewhere? It's amazing how many, you know, and, and I got this tackle box and I got, I got bait in it. I got all sorts of, I got some, I got some jigs and lures in there. One time, you know, you use it one time and it's just going to sit there because the right, you, you're ready for unique situations. Do you know what our problem is in the church? Brethren, we have no tackle box. We don't have the equipment to do the job. We don't have the training to do the job. We don't put the time in to do the job. But if I said you're going to get the big buck, you spend the rest of your life looking. There's something wrong. Brother, there's something wrong with us. The greatest evangelist, one of the greatest evangelists of our era, Pastor Bay, his name is Bobby Banks. Everywhere Bobby went, Everywhere he went, the church grew. He was an incredible evangelist. His wife, Wilma, is still with us. She's 81 years old. And I see her every year. I saw her yesterday. I visit her every year. She tells me stories about Bobby. Everywhere Bobby went, every school preaching he was at, the church, the students would grow. He was an amazing evangelist. Him, Jewel Miller, Ivan Stewart, they went around in the 1970s into the 80s, back into the 60s, and they trained every church of Christ how to grow. They trained a, a, an army of evangelists. And the church of Christ was never better. I had a, if I named this preacher, you'd know him. Everyone would know him. He called me, Central Texas, several years ago. He said, Rob, he says, I need you to come. It's 10 years ago. I was still preaching at Willett. He said, I said, what do you need? He says, I need you to do an evangelism seminar. I said, brother, I said, you don't need me to come to Texas to do an evangelism seminar. He says, yeah, we do. 
I said, why is it? He said, Robert, we haven't had a seminar on evangelism in Central Texas in 20 years. Brethren, we will not turn the ship until we get our tackle box and until we learn how to be evangelists. Men, tonight, I want you to put as much energy into saving souls as you do getting your catfish. I want you to put as much energy into saving souls as you do getting the big buck. Ladies, I want you to put as much energy as you can, as you do into cooking that good recipe, going shopping, or do whatever else it is you do. Brethren, you got to get a tackle box. This is called fishing for men. If it was me, I'd have it in my tackle box. He'll teach you how to be an evangelist. You have got to learn how to do it or you'll never be successful. That man that took us fishing, he was the best at what he did. It wasn't an accident. He knew his trade. They walked into the church building. They made a beeline right for me. And uh, he got right up to the podium. He said, you the preacher here? I said, yes, sir. My name's Rob Whitaker. He said, name's Richard Pratt, my wife, Daisy. He said, nice to meet you, Richard. He said, uh, he said, got a question for you, preacher. You just preach the Bible? I said, sir, that's all we preach here. He said, good. Church I left last week stopped doing it years ago. He said, preacher, I'll be listening to you. I said, I, I invite you to. He sat down in his pew, and his wife sat down next to him, Daisy, and they went through the Bible class. Man, they took more notes. Their Bible was open. They're looking through the scripture. Man, if a pen could smoke, theirs would have been on fire. They were writing down every passage there was. I, I quoted in my sermon. She's looking at me. He's writing down the passages. So the members went up and greeted them. And it's my turn. I walked up to Richard. I said, now, Richard. I said, did I just preach the Bible this morning? He said, son, that's all you preach. Haven't heard that much scripture in years. I said, good. I said, would you like to know more about this church? He said, sure would. I said, I'll tell you what, let's go out to eat. Always eat. It's never wrong to eat. So we, we took him out to eat. We were just talking and we set up the appointment. They came out to the, 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 the place and uh, we sat down around the table. Just so happened to have these booklets back in the Bible. Heard of it? Green booklet, John 8, 22. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Hey, Richard, what goes in the blank? He said, uh, truth. I said, write it down. He wrote it down, and we're starting to do the Bible study. He's loving it. I mean, days they're eating it up. Preacher, I didn't know there was a difference between the Old and New Testament. I do now. And I said, uh, would you guys like to have come for a second study? Sure would. He said, he said preacher, I tell you what, I'm sold. Sign me up. Sign you up? He said, yeah, preacher. He said, uh, no, they don't need a second study. Just sign me up. He said, you've proven it. You, you use the Bible. I said, well, Richard, it really doesn't work that way. He said, well, preacher, I mean, when you make the sale, you make the sale. He said, I don't need more. He, I said, now, Richard, I said, there's some things you don't know. Would you come back for a second study? He said, well, I'll come back. So he came back. We sat around the, top, the table. We did our second study. And at the end of the second study, he reached into his coat pocket. He pulled out his checkbook. He got out his pen. He said, how much is this going to cost you? I said, cost you? Yeah, to join your church. I said, Richard, it doesn't cost anything to join the church. Richard, it doesn't cost anything to become a member of the church. He said, sure, you're the last church. If I missed, they'd send me a bill. A bill? I said, there will be no bills here, Richard. I said, I said, Richard, I said, what we need to do is another, another Bible study. Rob, are we that bad of sinners that we need another Bible study? I said, no, it's not about your, well, it is about your sin. But I said, I tell you what, there's some things you don't know, and one more study you'll get it. He said, if you think so, preacher, well, Richard's a little little bit uh, agitated. And he, he left that study. And Daisy, I can't believe this man won't let us join his church. And uh, now Richard's a logger. And he sells uh, his timber to one of the local sawmills. Well, Hugh Wayne Clark, Clark Lumber Company, owns the largest sawmill in the state of Tennessee. He's also one of our elders. He employs half the county. And um, and so uh, we're um, Richard selling his logs, and the sales clerk is Joe Lynn, another elder. He walks into the office, says, "Joe Lynn, I got a bone to pick with you. That little preacher back there won't let me join your church." Excuse me, Richard, what are you talking about? He said, "Your preacher back there, and Will Ed won't let me join your church." And he, Richard, what did he tell you to do? Well, he said I needed a Bible study. Well, then I think that's exactly what you need to do. We sat down for that third study. Richard doesn't know his loss. So he reads his Bible. He said, Bob, uh, I can't join this church, can I? I said, no, you can't, Richard. He said, Rob, would you baptize Daisy and I? I said, I'll be glad to. And we did. Daisy and Richard have become amazing servants in the church. 
they never miss. They're always there. Mission trip, Daisy and Richard are there. VBS, Daisy and Richard are there. Door knocking, Daisy and Richard are there. Daisy and Richard are dedicated servants of the cross. Every Christmas and Thanksgiving, they're in our home. I don't know what you do during the holidays, but I'll tell you what my family does. We invite all the new converts into our home, and we, and we join together. They are my family. If you're not evangelizing, you're missing out on the greatest blessing of life. Brethren, there isn't anything in this world that tops being a soul winner. I'm convinced that the biggest mistake we're making in personal evangelism is a lack of personal Bible study. Brethren, we're not studying the Bible. We're good people, and we love people, and we're kind people, but we're not studying the Bible. We're facing a generational crisis in the church of Christ. We literally have children that are growing up and they've never seen their mother do a Bible study. They've never seen dad crack a Bible with somebody. We have children that are growing up and they've never seen a Bible study. And now they have grown up and they have had children. And we have two generations of families sitting in our pews right now that don't even know what a Bible study looks like. And we wonder how we're done. But don't worry, we've got a program for you. Don't worry. We have a program. I mean, if you want to make a church grow, you've got to have the right program. And if you don't have enough programs, you won't grow. You've got to have program. And in fact, I was sitting, I, I used to get phone calls when I was at Will Ed. I, I, I get churches and I had a large church in Nashville call me. The eldership said, hey, preacher, can you come over here and teach us how to grow? We hear what you guys are doing way out in the middle of nowhere. See, Will Ed had started to, to build a reputation. When I got there, we were 220. 230, 240, we live an hour from a Walmart, 250, 260, 270, 280. No one moves to Willette, they move away. 280, 290, 300. And we did that because we baptized people and they started to see it. And they would call and they say, preacher, they said, can you come tell us what you're doing? One eldership looked at me and said, what's your magic bullet? Magic bullet? Like I had a rabbit to pull out of the hat. There's no magic bullet to it, brother had another eldership call me and they said, could you could, could come meet with us? I said, sure. And so we, we set an appointment that, that, that uh, morning of the appointment, terrible storms were roaring across Tennessee. They said, Rob, we can't make it. Can we do phone conference? I said, absolutely. So we, we, I got the phone set up, all the eldership was set up and they said, can, testing, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Rob, go ahead, explain, what can we do to grow? I said, I'll tell you what it is, it's real simple. It's called personal Bible study. Now my wife, now hang on preacher. What did you call it? I said, personal Bible studies. Now my wife, now preacher, hang on. Personal Bible what? Personal Bible studies. Now my wife and I, now pre hey, preacher, slow down. Per personal Bible study? I said, yes, sir, it's called personal Bible study. And my wife and I have, now preacher, where do you get these people from? Oh, uh, they sit in your pews. Huh? I said, they're in your pews. And and, and my, now my wife and I, invite, now preacher, hold on. And they said, where do you get them from? I said, um, Sir, they're, they're in your community. Have y'all ever tried house to house, heart to heart? I said, we baptize people every year because of that. House to house what? The ma oh, the magazine. Yes, we sent that out one time. Somebody got offended. We dropped it. I said, oh, boy. Um, I said, I tell you what. Hey, hey, preacher, have you guys ever done the big VBS? What? No, no sir. What is the big VBS? I'll tell you what we do. We rent the bouncy houses and we rent the carnival rides and we fill our parking lot and we invite the community and we bring them in. And I said, no, sir, I've never done a big VBS before. Now, sir, where, where, where do you get these? Now, what is it that your wife and, and you do? I said, sir, it's called personal, but I'm so excited. It's got personal Bibles. Now, my wife and I use something called back to the Bible. Now, we bring them over to the house. We have a meal together. And after the meal, we just ask them, would you like to know? Hello. Hello. Brethren, I tried for 45 minutes to explain to an eldership that you grow churches by personal Bible study, and I couldn't do it. Either they hung up on me or the storms, and I pray God it was the storms, disconnected us. I was so irritated by that phone call that I got on my phone and I said, honey, I said, I need you to listen to me. I said, please don't ever let me forget this phone call. And I rehearsed the phone call to her. And then when I hung up, I got on the Google and I Googled churches of Christ, and I wanted to know what in the world are churches doing out there? Can I share with you what I found? Brother, we got a program for everything. I tell you what, I've, there's never been more programs in the church of Christ than there are today. We've got youth programs. We, we have got teens. You've got teens. we got the program for you. Man, we've got 
Youth Day, Bible Camp. We, we got, man, we got it all going on. Man, we're, we come to this church. We got the youth group here. Man, we got the singles group. You, if you're a single person, we got a group for you. We got a program. Don't you worry. We'll help you find a Christian mate. You come to this church. We got the special, you got the special singles ministry. Then we got the married ministry. We got the special ministry. He, I, now, listen, wives, if you got a husband, you need a ministry for him. I know he's rough around the edges. We will smooth out those rough ends. He needs a ministry. And then we need a, I tell you what, we've got the divorce program. If you go through, we got the parenting program. We got the addiction program. If you're addicted, come to the church of Christ. We can break your habits. Depression. If you're depressed, come to the church of Christ. Silver wings. Gentlemen, when you get older and get the silver wings, we still need you. Come to our program. We, we will put you to work. Silver wing. And for those of you who are older, we got Bible bingo every Friday night. We got the golden oldies. Brethren, we have a program for every person alive. Do you know what I couldn't find? Jason and I looked. I want to know where the program is that teaches the church members how to do Bible studies. I want to know where the church is that's teaching their members how to be soul winners. And I couldn't find it. I was disgusted by what I heard. The more churches I click, the more angry I got. I don't know how Peter ever made it. I don't know how Paul ever survived. I was sitting in my easy chair one night, and uh, Nicole looked at me. She says, Rob, they're talking about you on Facebook. I said, what do you mean? I said, what are they saying about me? She said, well, listen to this. There's this preacher out there, and he's telling the church we're dying. He's telling the church... We're about to close our doors. Don't believe him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I said, well, if I'd name him, you'd know him, Jason. He's a big name preacher. I said, well, honey, keep reading. He said, yeah, he, there's, there's this preacher out there. And he, he says that we're dying. And, 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 and I'll tell you what, he says, he says uh, don't believe him. Because, you know, at the polishing the pulpit, Jason, we had 5,000 people show up. Did you know? Did you know at the last of leaders we had a 10,000? And did you know at the big winter retreat in Pigeon Forge we had 20,000 young people last year? We're not dying, we're a growing. You know what the problem is with that? Number? We're counting our own people. Brethren, we're, we're not counting the sinners, we're counting the saved. Of course it looks good when you count your own people. Brethren, I don't know a brotherhood work in the whole kingdom that would tell us we're growing. Everybody knows we're dying. Everybody knows churches are closing their doors. Burying your head in the sand isn't going to help. Brethren, you need a reality check this afternoon. You know what our problem is? He nailed it. We're in religious focus. It's all about Bible camp, polishing the pulpit, marriage retreat, VBS. Name all the activities you do. It's all about you. It's all about us. It's all about, you know, making that local church. We got to attract those Christians. Brethren, I'm not concerned about you. I don't mean to be disrespectful. I'm concerned about the sinner. I'm concerned about the kingdom's roster. I'm concerned about getting out here to the lost. Brethren, you're already saved. I shouldn't have to spend my time coddling you. I need your help to get to the lost. I need your help to bring the saved, the lost in, so we can teach them the gospel. We need to be out. We have become keepers of the aquarium instead of fishers of men. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. I'll prove it to you. How many Bible studies have you had in the last five years? How many times have you sat around the table and you sat there and you had an actual, I didn't say you had a talk. Oh, I talk to people all, I'm not, I'm not asking you how many talks you have. Oh, yeah, but preacher, yeah, I talk to people all the time. Yeah, Jesus, I, I tell you what, preacher, yesterday I went into the break, this is break room, Bob. I went into the break room and, and I, I got out my Bible and I read to the, I said, everybody in the break room, listen to this. And I read them, Mark 16, 16. And now my friend, he got out his Bible. He said, now, Bob, he said, what are you going to do with John 3, 16? He read it. I said, I'm going to read Mark 16. I read Mark. He said, man, you ought to have heard him chanting back and forth. Go, Bob. And I, Mark 16, 16. And it was a wonderful Bible study preacher. You ought to have seen me defend the truth. And then there's Techie Tom. Techie Tom. Preacher, last night on the Facebook, I believe that's where you need to evangelize on the Facebook. Here. I put on my feed Romans 16, 16. My church is in the Bible. Where is yours? 
He said, man, you should have seen the feed, man. They were there. They were writing down all these, these, oh, man, preacher, wonderful. Hundreds of responses. And then there's little Sally. Sally said, no, preacher, I'm not very good at this, but I, I took my friend to the tea room, and I gave him a gospel meeting flyer, and I invited them to church. Do you know what the problem is with all that? None of that is a Bible study. Brethren, none of that wins souls. The problem is that we have in our mind a concept of evangelism that has nothing to do with the strategy given by the Word of God. So tonight, we're going to begin putting the Bible back into personal Bible study. Number one, write this down. Here's your notes. I'm going to give you a bunch tonight. Open your Evangelism Simplified Guidebook to the very last page. And I want you to write down the seven strategies for success. These come right from the Bible. Number one, you got to learn tonight that you have got to defer and not debate. You have got to defer and not debate. You cannot enter into a debate with your, your friend or you will lose. Brethren, if you continue to debate people about the truth, you will lose. I want you to defer every question they throw at you. You know who's going to have the hardest time in this church doing that? Jason. You know why? Because Jason is wired up. He's built to answer questions. If he's like, if you're like me, Jason, I went to school and I'm going to answer every question they give me. I know the I know the questions better than they know the answers. I know what they believe better than they do. I have studied it inside and out. I know the arguments. I know where they got it from. I know the history of it. I have the verses memorized, and I can even put it into a syllogism if need be. I was reading about Jesus, and I noticed something. He did not do that. Jesus did not chase rabbits. When people threw out questions to Jesus, he completely ignored them. Jesus never chased their questions down. Jesus never acquiesced. He never gave up the field. Because here's the principle. You want to write this down. He who asks the question controls the study. Why in the world would Jesus let you control the study when he is the rabbi? Why would the person who has the truth allow someone else to control the study? Because when you allow someone else to put you on the defensive and ask all the questions, you lose every time. I don't care if you're a preacher, an elder, or a brand new Christian, you lose. And by the way, Jesus never did that. We defer their questions because of one of two things. Number one, they're not asking the right question. Number two, they're not ready to hear the answer. It's either one of the two. I am not going to answer the question because they're not asking the right question. And number two, they're not ready for it. And in fact, Jesus said in John 16 and 12, as the disciples asked the Lord questions, these were friendly. These, these were friends. These weren't foes. Of all the people, Jesus could have, of course, the disciples want to know. And what does Jesus say? Well, you know what? I have a lot of things I could tell you. But you can't bear them. Huh? Yeah, you can't understand it. The, you mean the master teacher, the greatest teacher the world has ever seen, could not explain some things to his own disciples? That's true. You know why? They weren't ready. Why in the world or would you want to start a Bible study on what do you believe about music? That was, Je that was Sheba Burton. I'm sitting in the living room. She says, yes, I do have questions for you. Now, I want to know why you people in the Church of Christ don't believe in music. Well, I tell you what, that's a softball. If you can't hit that out of the park, you ought to quit. And the old Rob would have hit a grand slam with it. Hey, Sheila, do you know there, there are actually two types of music in the Bible? There's vocal music and instrumental music. Now, the word solo in Ephesians 5.19, it means to train the strings up. And now there are seven verses in it. I could win the debate if I want. But I don't care about the debate anymore. I have one goal. I want a Bible study, and I will get there. I looked at Sheila, and I said to her, I said, Sheila, that is a great question. I said, do you believe in music? I'm not going to let her control the study. I will control the study. Do you believe in music? She says, sure, I do. I love music. I said, wonder. I said, what kind of music do you have? Well, we have a piano, and so-and-so and so plays it. I said, well, how long is it? And so, well, for 20-some years. And I said, have you ever played Amazing? Well, of course, I love the Amazing Grace. Rob, we play that every Sunday. I said, have you ever played Nothing But the Blood? She said, we love Nothing But the Blood. I said, I do too. She does not even realize what I'm doing. I will not answer the question. Do you really want to start a Bible study 
fighting on her field because if you do, you will lose. You want to play pickup on their court? You're already down court. They know how that basket bounces. They know how that rim is stiff. They know which way is up and down you go. See, I don't, I don't enter into somebody else's field. I'm not doing it. I'm going to defer it every time. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be coded in and baited in into some discussion, and I don't even know where it's going. So I deferred it. Rob, where did you get that idea? Jesus. You take your Bibles. Can I show you the principle? Luke 10, 25. They're all three right here. I'm going to show them to you tonight. Take your Bible. Open the Mark, Luke 10. Luke chapter 10. We're going to spend some time in the Bible. This is all about God. This is not about Rob. I just didn't come up with this on my own. These are sitting right in front of us. Luke chapter 10. I'm, in fact, I'm studying it. And I see this. Luke 10, 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him and said, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a Bible study. That's a Bible study. I said, I wonder what Jesus did. Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I, and Jesus said, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. No. Jesus said, um, he didn't answer. He did not answer the question. He acted as though the man had never even asked the question. In fact, what I learned is that when people would ask Jesus questions, he deferred them. Jesus did not answer them. Jesus is not in the asking. He's not in the answering business. Friends, he is in the asking business. It is the Lord who asks the questions. He's not going to let you control the stuff. By the way, that lawyer, you know why he was there? I'll tell you why he was there. Because the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes were tired of losing. They were tired of, uh, of, of Jesus always showing them up. Jesus could always whip them in an argument. And they were tired of it. And so they went to this lawyer who was an expert in the law. And do you know what lawyers do? Do you know what they're experts at finding? Loopholes. And he was an expert at finding loopholes in the law of Moses. And they, man, we got this problem, lawyer. And we'll pay you this money. Can you find us a way out of this Old Testament law? He said, now there's this little caveat here. If you do it this way, you know, he was an expert at it. And they brought him in. They brought in the lawyer. They said, sick him, lawyer. Show Jesus up. And Jesus knew exactly what was in his heart. He knew he was a Pharisee. You know what my problem was? Brother, I was more interested in winning the argument. To me, it was all about the debate. I'm going to show them up. I'm going to show I know more than you do about the Bible. And the problem was that I won. I always won. But I really didn't win. Because every time I won the argument, I lost the soul. You know, Jesus is consistent. I started to learn something. This isn't a one-time occurrence. Every time people came to Jesus, he did the same thing. He did not answer. And when we were coming into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came in him and said, Lord, they said, Jesus, as he was teaching, by what authority doest thou these things? And who gave you this authority? Oh, man, that, if there's ever a question that a preacher would answer, it would be that one. I mean, this is my question. I, I is a great one here. And notice what the Lord said. Jesus answered and said unto them, mm -hmm. I also will ask you one thing. Well, Lord, don't be disrespectful. They've asked you a question. No, I will ask you one thing. And if you can answer my question, I'll answer yours. By the way, the baptism of John, which was it, from heaven or not? They said, oh, they begin to reason among themselves. Well, that's a hard one. We, if we say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did you not believe him? But if we shall say of the men, we fear the people, for they all hold John as a prop. Jesus, we cannot tell you. And I want you to notice what the Lord did. Look carefully, brother. He did not answer. The Lord did not chase rabbits. The Lord was not in the answering business. The Lord is not going to let them control the study. Look at Mark 10, 17. Here's another Bible study. And when he was coming to the way, there came one running and kneeling and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, oh. Hey, why'd you call me Lord? Jesus, he just asked you what he must do to have eternal life. You need to answer the question, Lord. No, I'm not doing that. But I would like to know why you called me good. Jesus always controlled the study. 
I don't know why brethren insist on getting the field up and letting someone who doesn't know the Bible control the study. Brethren, Jesus never did that. He never allowed the non-believer to ask the questions and control the study. Jesus asked the question. Number two, write this down. Show, don't tell. I don't want you to quote them the Bible. I know you know the Bible, and I'm so thankful that you have Romans 16, 16 memorized. And I'm thankful that you have uh, Mark 16, 16 embedded in your mind. I don't want you to quote it. Brethren, I want them to read it. They need to read their Bibles. I don't want you to quote it to them. Rob, now my friends have told me that you people over there in the Church of Christ believe you're the only ones going to heaven. Isn't that so, Rob? Now, if that's not a set-up question, I don't know what is. But I was ready for it, and I knew it was going to come. And this is what I said. I looked over at Sheila, and I said, Sheila, that is a great question. I said, I, I th- in fact, I think it deserves an answer. By the way, who told you that? I don't know. I said, well, I'm just curious. Um, Sheila, would it be okay if I showed you the answer? Well, well, show me. I said, yeah, like we'd open our Bible. You mean like our Bible? Jackie, can we have a Bible study with the preacher for the church of Christ? Now, Sheila, I don't think it's ever wrong to study the Bible. Brethren, I am not going to tell her. I don't want you to tell anybody. Any, I, it, it doesn't matter what you say. The authority is not on your lips and tongues. We need to get them to the book. This is where religious error is defeated. This is where moral walls are brought down. We need people to come face to face with the word of God. And Jesus taught us to do it. Look at Luke 10. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus deferred it. He did not answer. He said, hmm. He said, what's written? Written? Jesus, just tell him. Why do you, why, why do you want him to go read some book? Jesus, you are the word. Just tell him. He says, no, I'm not doing it. What is written in the law? I don't want you to go to commentaries. I don't want you to go to the Mishnah or the Talmud. I want you to go to the law of God. Now, I missed this for years, Jason. I didn't see it. Plain as day. How readest thou? I want you to read the word of God because the power of God can break through every religious error you've ever taught and it can bring you to your knees at the cross of Jesus Christ. Brethren, we need people reading their Bibles. This is where the power is. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And I'm not telling anybody anything. When I get to the lost, I'm going to have them read their Bibles. It's easy to tell Jason no. It's easy to tell Rob no. It's hard to tell God no. Let them read Mark 16, 16, and let them try to tell God it doesn't mean what it says. I'll tell you it doesn't mean what it says all day long. Because I can argue with you and win. You will not win when you argue with God. God wins every day. Why don't we use the two of you days? But we'll tell him all about it. Now, in Mark 16, 16, it says, he, I don't want you to tell him what Mark 16, 16 says. I want them to read it. Remember I told you that Scarlet told me two things I'll never forget? I told you one. Let me tell you the second one. The second one, it was, it's amazing. We, we were sitting there in this conversation and going back and forth, and, and, and Scarlett had just finished story number one. She says, now, Rob, i got to tell you what happened after I became a Christian. I said, well, Scarlett, what happened? She says, well, my life was miserable. Rob. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, she said, when I became a Christian, my friends, they were relentless. Scarlett, why'd you do it? Scarlett, your mom is a Baptist, your grandma's a Baptist, your dad's a Baptist, your brother's a Baptist, great grandma's a Baptist, and so and so's a Baptist. Scarlett, why'd you do it? Scarlett, come back. Scarlett, you shouldn't have done that. I, I, I was in my room. My best friend said, Scarlett, we got to go. I said, what's wrong? She said, I don't understand what you just did. And she says, well, what do you mean? She says, Scarlett, why? I mean, of all places, the Church of Christ? Be a Methodist. We're Presbyterian. Why would you go to the Church of Christ, Scarlett? Of all places, you know how strange those people are. Oh, she said, Rob, I'd had it up with you. She said, I looked at my friend, and I said this. I said, do you really want to know? Because if you know what I know, you'll do what I did. 
I believe those are some of the wisest and strongest words I've ever heard come out of a baby's mouth. And she sounds a lot like her daddy, Sheila. We have no choice because it's what the Bible says. Brethren, when people come face to face with the word of God, it gives them no choice. You either obey or you don't. Through thy precepts, I gain understanding and I hate every thought. No more gimmicks, no more carrots, no more sugar sticks, no more programs. Brethren, we don't need any more programs in the church, but we need our evangelists. We need to rise in our pews, an army of soul winners, as soldiers to go out in our communities and fight for God. Because if you'll fight for him, he'll win. He doesn't know how to lose, just we do. We're good at losing now. We've been losing for 40 years. And we just accept it. Your God doesn't know how to lose. But he will not fight for you if you sit in your pew. But the word of Christ dwelling you richly, how does it get there? You got to get the word in them. They got to read it. They got to see it for themselves. Don't tell them what the Bible says. Show them what it says. Number three, last principle. Here it is. We got to learn to plant. We got to learn to plant. Stop picking. Plant. How many of us in this audience tonight, I'm just curious, how many in the audience tonight grew up in the Church of Christ? How many of you grew up in the church? Man, look at that. All right. Put your hands down. When I was growing up in the church, I had a Bible class teacher. Y'all remember your Bible class teacher? Mine was Belle Lee. Oh, Miss Belle Lee taught me the Bible. I mean, that woman was always making us memorize scripture. And I, when I went to the school of preaching, uh, we had an entry exam. I don't know if y'all have entry exams at Brown Trail, but it was an entry exam, okay? And here's one of the test questions. I want you to list all the scriptures you have memorized. They had to take the sheet away. Miss Bell had taught me so many verses, I just kept writing them down. I had John 4, 24. I just started Genesis 1, 1. I started writing. And I had, I had, I'd grown up in the church, and I'd memorized scripture all those years. There's Miss Bell Lee. Miss Bell Lee taught me the parable of the sower and the seed. You know how she taught it? Um, would you get some dirt, put it in your cup, kids? And I put my dirt in the cup. Now grab that little bean seed, put it in the cup. You know what we're going to do, don't you? And put the water in the cup. You know where it's going, don't you? Window seal. Put it in the window seal. Let's come back next week and see what happens. Now let's learn the parable. The parable is this, the seed is the word of God. But that on the good ground fell, they which have an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Brethren, this is a lesson that we have learned since our youth. Plant the word. Because if you find good and honest hearts, it'll grow. Why don't we believe that? Luke 10, 25, it's right here. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. He tempted him. This lawyer wasn't interested in the truth. This lawyer was a charlatan. This lawyer was dishonest. This lawyer didn't care about the truth. And what did Jesus do with the lawyer? He taught him anyway. Because the Lord did. Everyone deserves the gospel. Even the charlatans deserve an answer. And the Bible says this lawyer was willing to justify himself. This lawyer didn't care about the truth. Jesus did. And you know what Jesus did? Jesus taught him the parable, the greatest parable ever told, the parable of the Good Samaritan, because Jesus wanted to get to his heart. Everyone deserves to hear the gospel. You've got to plant the seed. You've got to show them the way. You've got to help them see it. I don't care who it is. And I got a phone call from a church. Hey, preacher, you guys been growing out there at Will Ed. I said, yes, sir. Could you come in over here to this uh, church and can you bring a team and just kind of show us the ropes? It was a big church. And I was surprised they called me, really. And uh, I said, sure, I'll grab a bunch of, I said, I'll tell you, how about July? I'll get my young people. We'll come on over and we'll spend four or five days. Can you put us up? And they said, sure, feed us. Absolutely. I'll be there. Always eat. Always eat. So I, I brought the young people over, some of the parents. We, I walked into the church office and the deacon of evangelism, you know, the deacon of evangelism. The deacon of evangelism had the map out. He said, now, preacher, the elders authorized us in quadrant one, two, sir. Uh, yes, Rob. I said, why is there an X in quadrant four? He said, well, the elders don't want us in quadrant four. I said, uh, sir, why aren't we in quadrant four? Well, not good candidates for the gospel. There, Rob, you know, a little needy. 
you know, they're going to ask for money. And we don't want to go in quadrant. Now, Rob, in quadrant one, those are the kind of people we're looking for. Now, we, now, Rob, I'm going to send you right over there. Yes, Rob. I said, brother, I think you just send me to quadrant four. Why in the world would you want to go to quadrant four? Because if the Lord was standing here, that's exactly where he would go. Brother, who gave us the right to determine who we teach and who we don't teach? They're not good candidates for the gospel there. We do it all the time. I'm going to show you how we do that. Preacher, now, I'll tell you what, Jason, I know you just came here, but you stay away from that hill. There are two women living together over there. And you know what that means, Jason, stay away. Now, Jason, over there, that they got beer cans on their house every Saturday night. We don't need that kind in the church. Now, over here, they've been going to that church all their life. They're not reachable. Now, Jason, this house over here, he used a four-letter word on me 20 years ago. Stay away from them. Now, Jason, that house over there, he is the preacher of that denomination. Brethren, when you're done eliminating everybody, there's no one left to teach, and you're good at it. You know why we don't teach anybody the gospel? Because you have eliminated every sinner you know already. Well, you can't teach family. Can't teach friends. Uh, you know, we probably lose the relationship. Brethren, we're in the picking business, and our Lord's in the planting business. Our Lord didn't pick, he planted. Brethren, every person deserves to hear the gospel of Christ, and it's your job to teach them. Your job is not to use your evangelistic perception. Your job is to plant the seed. My family, I, I, I raised my children in a church building. Not a bad place to be raised. And uh, I take Jared and Hannah, my, my wife, she will, here she testified to this. Every morning, they get up and she drive into the church building. We homeschooled at the church building. And Nicole had some friends out there. And, and the kids would run in about 11 o'clock. Dad, Dad, it's 11 o'clock, gotta go eat. Now, now, it's important to know this. Now, you may not know this, but farmers eat at 11. If you go at 12, there's no food left. Got to go at 11. So we, there's only one place at Willad that you can eat. It's the little store across the street at the church. Willad's a very small place. It's smaller than Cato Mills. Cato Mills is a metroplex. So this is just a church building and a little restaurant, all we have. And so we would, we would walk over to the, the restaurant every day. And I'd walk into this restaurant, and there's this man in the corner. Didn't know who he was. Hey, everybody. The preacher's in here. Hey, preacher, yeah, Campbellite. Come over here, Campbellite. Uh, come on. Hey, everybody, the water logs here. The Campbellites are here. Come on in now, Campbell. Man, I tell you, the old Rob would have showed him exactly what a Campbellite was. I'd have quoted every scripture in the Bible at the man. All I want is a Bible study. I don't really care about the name things. All I want to do is study the Bible. I walked over to the man. And I'll look in the church. Sir, you see that woman back there? That is my wife. She is the best cook in Macon County. I'll tell you what's going to happen tonight. My wife is going to fix for you. She's going to fix a gravy, corn on the cob, roast. It's going to be the most tender roast you've ever eaten. That little girl right there, that's my daughter. That's the butter pie maker you've ever seen. We're going to invite you to, really? I said, yes, sir. You're going to eat good tonight. Really pretty. I said, yes, sir. I want you at my house. And I live at 201. And I I said, now, after the, after the eating, we're going to have a Bible study together. Bible study. Preacher, now settle down. I said, yes, sir, we're going to open our Bible. Now, preacher, I didn't ask for no Bible study. Simmer down now, preacher. Do you know what just happened? I planted, and he picked. Lots of preaching. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first be spoken to you. But seeing that you put it off from yourself, and you judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Our job is to plant. I'll let them pick. But I will not pick again. I will not eliminate anyone in my life again. I will plant a seed to everybody I meet. Because the scriptures have the power to divide the honest heart from the dishonest heart. I don't. It is not your job to pick. That is the greatest prejudice we have in the church, and we better get rid of it. Three principles I've taught you tonight. Defer, don't debate. Show, don't tell. Plant, don't pick. I left our second work. And uh, it's been a year or two. And um, 
one of the members of that church caught me at Paulson the pulpit. So I'm in the hallway. Hey, Rob. He said, hey, brother. He said, I need to talk to you for a minute. I said, sure. He said, can you come up here to the side? I said, oh, boy. He pulled over to the side. He said, I, I got a problem, Rob. I said, what's going on? He said, we got a new preacher. And I said, well, how's he doing? He said, well, he said, Rob, he's teaching a new evangelism strategy. I said, well, I'll, I'm all for it. Tell me about it. I may learn something, you know. He said, he calls it um, conversational evangelism. I said, well, I don't even know what that means. I said, well, what does that mean? He says, well, he says, Generation Z, P, or D, whatever we're in today, they don't like Bible studies. I said, really? He said, they don't re respond well to it. I said, I didn't know that. I have Bible studies all the time. I didn't know this. You know. And, and he, said, he said, yes, they don't like them. And he said, Bible studies don't work today. I didn't know that either. And, um, and I, I, he, said, he said, Rob, he thinks what we need to be doing is we need to have good conversations with people about the Lord, little talks, and then get them interested. And then invite them to church. They hear the sermon. They come forward, and he baptizes them. I said, who am I to dismiss conversation, evangelism? Brother, how many baptisms have you had since I left? We haven't had one. May I submit to you tonight that if you want to be effective at helping churches grow, you do Bible studies. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, and the testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. Brethren, what simple people need today is a Bible study. They don't need your little talks anymore. We need to get people in this book. I'm going to share one story in the message. Several years ago, he told me his story. After he told it, I, I wrote it down. I said, would you mind if I share this with every church? He said, you may share it if it will help. I had little interest in the church in my teenage years. When I was about 19 years old, I, I noticed there was something missing in my life. So I, I began to search for the church of the Bible. I visited several denominations after I joined the Navy and uh, looking for the church. I ended up being based at an air station near, near Pacquiao River, Maryland. At the same time, I was unaware I had a brother named uh, Terry, and uh, um, he was actually studying the ministry in the church. I didn't know. One Sunday morning, I decided to take a taxi to the nearby church at Christ at Lexington Park, Maryland. I was immediately surrounded. They uh, showered me with attention. They took me out to eat. They invited me in their homes. They, they invited me back. It was, it was wonderful. They even gave me a ride from the base to the church. They provided me transportation from that day forward. I did not know anything about the church, so I took communion like everybody else. Now, soon after I attended, my, one of my friends, he was a young fellow sailor, he, he asked me, he said, you remember the Church of Christ? I said, no. He became aware of it, and he said, well, you don't need to take me to you. He said, I didn't understand that, so, but I kept going. Now, the members continued to be very hospitable. They invited me into their home. It wasn't long before their minister, his name was Frank Starling. Frank said, uh, would you like to come over to my house and eat? Sure. I went over to the house, and uh, after we ate, he brought out this old film strip projector. And he hooked it in and turned on the Jewel Miller film strip Bible study. I watched the Jewel Miller film scripts. I lost all the lessons. When I finished watching the lessons, it was obvious. I'm at the church that you find in the Bible. I was baptized May 16, 1962. Brethren, do you know why I'm telling you this story? Because if that Bible study never happened, I would not be. Because that man is Gary Whitaker. Brethren, I want you to understand tonight what the power of one Bible study is going to do. Because of that one Bible study, my dad decides he's going to marry, he's going to marry a Christian. He goes looking. He goes all the way through Ohio looking. He finally finds this, this, this young lady. She's the preacher's daughter. Her name's Kathy. Grandpa quickly wanted to know what his intentions were. He married her. And because of that one Bible study, they come together and they have two children. Their firstborn is Rob. Because of that one Bible study, Rob's going to grow up and he's going to become a Christian because of that one Bible study. 
my sister, Christina, she's going to grow up and she's going to become a Christian because of one Bible study. Because of that one Bible study, I'm going to go out there and look for a Christian. And I find her in the state of Tennessee, all the way from Texas. And her name's Nicole. And because of that one Bible study, I marry Nicole and I have two children. Because of that one Bible study, my, my daughter's going to grow up and she's going to become a Christian. Because of that one Bible study, my son's going to grow up and he's going to become a Christian. Because of that one Bible study, my sister's going to go to Freed Hartman. And she's going to find her husband, Joey Barkley. They're going to have two daughters because of that one Bible study. Michaela's going to grow up. She's going to become a Christian. Maddie's going to grow up and Maddie's going to become a Christian. Brethren, what I want you to do tonight is have one Bible study. Because it won't be just one. I have a question for this church today. Brethren, are you concerned about the country you live in? Are you concerned that you're watching your nation disintegrate before your very eyes? Are you concerned that there won't be a, a country here again if, if, if changes are not made and we don't bend our knees and bow our heads and get back to God? Because I am. But I've got news for you tonight. You will not win a spiritual war fighting political battles. The answers to what ails our country are not in the Republican Party. The, the answers to what ails our nation are not in the Democrat Party. We don't need any more social justice warriors or cultural warriors in this country. We need to rise a nation of Christian soldiers to do Bible studies. We need Christians to evangelize. And it's the only way we turn things around. Friends, tonight, I want my brethren here to get about doing Bible studies as you were about Donald Trump. I want you to love sex as much as God loves you and gave his son. Brethren, I want you to evangelize. And if I got to get down to my hands and knees to not even beg you to do a Bible study, if that's what it will take, I'll do but not until the church of Christ awakes out of the pews, the sleeping giant who has failed for two generations will this nation ever have hope. Will you come back tomorrow for me? Because we're just getting started. Brethren, I'm going to give you four more principles tomorrow that will work. I get them right from the word of God. And if you'll take these to heart and you'll implement the strategy that I'll teach you tomorrow, Potato mills will never be the same. I love you, brethren. Thank you for being here on a Friday night. And um, I hope that you'll uh, take a look at some of the materials that we have. Do not forget Fishing for Men. It's a great tool. And it's one that I highly recommend you put in your toolbox. It's one that will teach you from being. You're going to learn from one of the greatest evangelists who's ever lived in the last century. And uh, I hope that that will help you. All right, let's go get a good night's sleep. Let's come back. Don't forget, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, is that right? 9 o'clock, the most important lesson of the series will take place. It's the most popular lesson of the series. Everyone tells me, Rob, that was the best lesson in the whole thing. So you haven't had that yet. You'll get it tomorrow at 9 o'clock so you don't oversleep. I believe the church here is providing a fellowship meal, a potluck, is that right? So those visiting, you'll have meals provided right here at the building. So we want you to come and be a part of the fellowship. Uh, don't forget, after lunch is the men and women session. And uh, as long as my wife is back up to speed, and I pray she is, she'll be teaching that lady session. And uh, ladies, you don't want to miss it. There are gifts that you have that we need to teach you how to use. And men, we're going to put it into gear. And so this will be an exciting time. I'm, I'm thankful for your presence. I know you've driven a long way. Is it okay if we bow before we dismiss? Is there any other announcement, Jason, we need to make? All right, let's pray together. Oh, Father and we thank you for your generous mercy and grace. You've given us more than we deserve. Our hearts are heavy, Father, as we see the kingdom in this country diminish in influence and in size. Father, we know thy word says to lift up our eyes and look on the fields, for they are white into harvest. May we believe that. Father, we pray that the church would evangelize again. We pray that we would grow Father, for we know the answer is not in our politicians, but it's in the great physician, Jesus Christ. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.